Awesome. Let's get started. Uh, my name's Johnny. I work with ThoughtWorks. You can find me on Twitter if you like. Um, that's my handle there. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today sharing the stage with all of the great talkers that speakers that have given talks today. Also a little nervous. We have a room full of technical people and I'm the design guy. I didn't match my jumper to this. I just noticed this now, but that's maybe that's typical of what designers do. Uh, so a little bit about me, I'm a service designer. What I mean by that is that I design and create products and services that people use. Um, often that's in context to a broader system. I didn't work on TFL, but that's the sort of thing that I mean. Um, and I care about things being functional and useful before being beautiful. I'm also a product strategist. Um, I've found that over, over the years, increasingly I'm spending more time trying to figure out what the right thing to build is as opposed to building the thing. So you can think of that as half business, half design. That's um, the, sort of the space that I'm usually working in. But I love working with technology teams, and that's because I like to ship. Um, it's so important to get good products to market. If a good product never makes it to market, it's not really a good product. So today, mostly what I want to talk about is ways of bringing strategy and execution closer together because they're important to each other. Um, and strategy has no worth. It's, it's worthless unless you ship. Similarly, execution benefits from strategy, or at least from good strategy. So how, why is it then that it's so difficult a lot of the time for technology people and strategists or strategists and designers to get on? Because often there's tension there. Um, I know there is because I've felt it so many times from, from different perspectives. I think part of the reason is people like this. This guy has the life, doesn't he? Um, I've really thought some terrible things about product strategists that they feel like this kind of person, even though this is a stock image, you know the kind of person that I mean. Um, or maybe it's that there are so many of them, a lot of the time I felt that there has been more strategists than people actually building it, which is a frustrating situation to be in. I'm sure you've been in that situation too. Or maybe it's Brent. <laughs> but this kind of perception goes two ways, and I think the technologists in the room would probably relate to people thinking that technology or IT people are people like this. So what's not funny about all of this, though, is how the work happens when these types of people get together. Um, what we see commonly, what, what, what we often see with strategy is too much talking, um, too much researching, too many of these things. And I think optimization is often expected of people that are delivering things, but it doesn't apply to business. So you're going to get the sense that um, there's a lot of things happening, but there's not a lot of doing happening. And that can be a frustrating situation. Um, it plays out like this sometimes. Here's some typical business strategy documents. I'm sure you've seen things like this before, typically in larger organizations. Or when you ask, what is the strategy? And I say, let me take you to the shelf where we have our folders full of strategy. Um, that's, that's hard to execute on, there's too much, it doesn't mean anything. Or maybe at a, maybe at a project level, it's a business case, and that there needs to be a model in order to define what goes in a business case, I think is missing the point a little bit. The way that plays out on a project for most of us um, is, is often something along the lines of this. Every, everybody, you know, we have this thing, Martin talked about this this morning, about contrasting uh, plan-driven sort of predictive planning as opposed to what we would prefer to be doing, which is adaptive, um, where we can respond to change. So when we try and predict things and we plan ahead and we try and have the full vision of what we're going to build and when it's going to happen and what the timing is, every, it starts off with best intentions and it looks something like this. But then it takes ages to do those things that seemingly shouldn't take so long. And then, uh-oh, a little bit longer it's taking. We can't help it. It's, we've been delayed. We've been held up because we have important decisions to make. The way that that plays out, though, is that at some point, around about here, this is what happens. And that's the question that follows. Can you build less and can you build it faster, please? Because we can't move the dates. And things move out and everyone's uncomfortable and, and people leave and it's not, it's, not a good, it's not a good experience. So from your response, people have been through that, right? That, that sounds familiar. I've been through that a few times. Um, it's not nice. So how can we do it better? What does better strategy look like? Uh, I think the first part to trying to answer that is understanding what strategy is for. And I think if we're trying to be adaptive, then and we think about strategy as uh, a plan to achieve an outcome, 
then it needs to be about getting started so that we can learn and respond um, in, in the first instance. Um, so how do we do that? Well, a few things that I, that I think, a few things that I believe are that it should be grounded in understanding. We should know the problem before we try and solve it. That's pretty straightforward. That's how most people think. Um, not how a lot of people act though with strategy. Lots of times I think we, we, miss the, we miss the understanding part and we try and deliver something that we don't fully understand. Um, it needs to give enough vision or direction to get started. I think that's the most important thing. It needs to, it needs to give enough of an idea of the direction you want to move in while being um, adaptive and feedback driven and changeable when we learn more from doing. And it needs to allow, importantly for technology teams, I think, and something that you don't see very often, is freedom to act. So this idea is about framing goals, um, framing goals to achieve. So you can think of that as hills to climb or challenges to conquer, um, but not directives to execute. So a strategy isn't a list of things that you should be delivering. It should be about outcome. It should be about impact. And if that's done well, it should allow a delivery team to have freedom to move, uh, to move toward creating that outcome in the way that makes the most sense. The people that are best placed to make those decisions and decide how to achieve that are the people that are doing the execution, not the people deciding what the strategy should be. So this is where the double diamond comes in. Um, has anyone seen this before or, some, or a version of this? Is this familiar to some people? Okay, cool. So more than anything, what the double diamond is about, it's about a way of thinking. It's not a prescriptive playbook. Um, and for me, its real power is that it's infinitely adaptable. Um, and what it tries to do is bring strategy and execution together. So the idea of the diamonds is that it maps out the divergent and convergent phases of the design process. Uh, this originated from the British Design Council around about 2005, and um, the British Design Council really then was about industrial design. So they were dealing with tangible things, and it has some uh, implications that go along with that. So that's why we've adapted it. What we've tried to do is take advantage of software deliveries, intangibility. The things that we produce aren't physical. We're not dealing with bricks and mortar. So what, what that, in essence, what that means is that we're able to respond to change better, and so we wanted to adapt this model so that it was more suitable for us. I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to walk through this in a bit more detail through the, through the talk, so I won't, I won't try and do it right now on this slide. So the journey begins with the trigger, and that could be anything. It could be an idea. It could be a piece of insight. It could be some kind of change or disruption. It could be a macroeconomic change. Um, and for us to arrive at a vision or a plan in the center there, um, the first thing we need to do is seek to understand. So um, we want to do this ideally with a, a mixed group of people. Often it's people talk about customers and technology and business getting together to try, and, to try and understand together. Some people call this a discovery phase. You've probably heard that, I'm sure, on projects. Um, some ways that we, that we might achieve that in, um, in, a, in a project are things like experience mapping or analytics. Maybe there's some experiments happening uh, maybe there's some ethnographic research. Lots of ways that you can build an understanding. Um, the important thing is that we understand before we try and uh, define what a strategy is. From that position of some knowledge, um, and I say some because we don't know everything yet, we find out more from doing than we do from analyzing. So from a point of some knowledge, we, we then try to converge on an initial direction. Where do we want to go first? What do we think is a meaningful direction to pursue? How can we get started quickly? Um, and that, that's really, I think, the essence of what a vision is, what a, what a plan or a strategy is. Um, I'm making it sound easy, but it really isn't. <laughs> um, it really is a hard thing. I don't have a formula for how you do this, how you do this um, convergent part, um, except to say that I know that it's hard, but it is easier if you have the right people in the room. So people talk about cross-functional, having uh, different perspectives in the room. Um, most importantly, though, I think that it needs to be done in weeks, not months. Um, you want to enable action to occur, um, as you, and you can start small. And then it needs to be actionable and measurable so that you know that if you, when you head off on this new direction, whether it's the right one and you should continue or whether you need to explore something else. So we're going to look at uh, one way of applying this way of thinking in practice. Um, this is an example from a current project. Um, the first thing to note is down the bottom that it's days and weeks. Um, so we move through that first phase up to defining an, an initial vision in four or five weeks, three or four weeks. 
Um, and that's, that seems like the, the right time scale to be doing those types of activities. If it's taking longer, um, then perhaps, perhaps it should be faster. Um, so on this real but sensitive project that I won't talk too much about, uh, this, is for, this is for a large global travel retail organisation. Um, where we're at at the moment is having to find the initial vision for a portfolio of products um, and initiatives. Some of those initiatives in that portfolio, these integrated strategies, uh, are digital products, some of them aren't. Um, and we're about to kick off on a few of those pieces, um, a few of those chunks that we've, that we've decided are worth pursuing. So I'm going to talk through um, quite quickly how we, how we got to that point. So we can look at the cross-functional discovery. For us, we wanted to build an understanding. We wanted to do it quickly. Um, so how we did that, mostly actually it was about analysis and research. Um, and it's a summary of some of the activities that we went through, the people that we met, types of the depth of uh, information that we looked at, um, all in order to build our understanding. This wasn't about solving anything, it was just about getting an understanding. And we looked broader at the wider ecosystem. So we wanted to build up a view of all of the things that surrounded this particular thing that we were exploring so that we could understand how it fits in with other things that have an, have an effect or have an impact on it. Um, we looked at customers, we wanted to know their pain. We wanted to see their overall journey and we wanted to understand how, um, how, how that dovetails in with different business processes, what their experience looks like, and more importantly, what their pain looks like. Um, so you know, you've probably seen similar things to this as an archetype. Um, other people talk about personas. This is just about getting closer to customers and what their pain is. Um, and the power of telling stories to be able to understand what a journey looks like in all of its different pieces and bring that to life as an example of something that somebody might have experienced. Um, that sounds like a really fun, nice thing to do, but actually it's more than that. It's really about um, being able to play back an understanding to, uh, to people that you're trying to influence, the, who, are, who are going to be deciding what direction you're heading next. A service blueprint is one way to do that. This is, you know, you could think of this as an artifact of understanding. This rolls up all the different things that we did, all the analysis, the customer research, um, and the other, the other things that we did, what it does in particular is um, describes customers' goals and behaviour and their pain points and ties it back into the business processes and technology systems that support that end-to-end -end experience. Um, this is really hard to do rapidly. Um, it took about two weeks to get to this point and when we needed to, um, when we needed to sit down with the um, business folks who would be deciding on what we do next, that room was um, full of people that had 10 plus years experience in their organisation and we needed to make ourselves credible in two weeks to a point where we were able to understand their business enough that we could have a conversation with them. Um, for me, that's one of the hardest things that I ever have to do. Um, it's worthwhile, but it, it's, always, it's always a really tricky thing. But critical, that understanding, having an understanding so that you can, um, so that you can start, so that you can begin to set a direction to move into. So what about converging on a vision then? What happens in the strategic workshop? Um, people have sat in, who's sat in a strategic workshop? A so-called strategic workshop. Yep. Did you have a lot of fun? Keep your hands up if you had fun at that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> They're not generally a lot of fun. Um, so I don't want to focus on techniques. I want to talk more about people and their perspectives <laughs> because that's really what it's about. The techniques are a little bit boring, I think unless you're really into workshop facilitation. And if that's you, I'm sorry. That's what I have to do, and it's, it's not much fun. Um, so, you know, in general, those techniques, the workshops are about getting, a shared, getting shared insight um, that can be used to, in, to, to create a vision for the future. There's lots of ways to do that. Here's one example of an output that, that shows shared insight. So this, this is kind of Venn diagram porn for me. This is... Um, <laughs> You know, it's pretty amazing. Um, so for this project we're working on, there are multiple different facets. So we have merchants and travellers and partners, and we have a domain to consider. And what this tries to do is map those together to try and understand where the overlaps are and things that we can consider when we're trying to move forward with a strategy. <coughs> so cross-functional teams, having the right people in the group. I think a lot of the time, particularly at ThoughtWorks, we talk about um, having a shared understanding, and I think that's generally the default position. There's certainly value in that. But I think that we should go further than that. I think it's about having, um, having a deeper understanding, uh, having a different understandings coming together, not just a shared understanding, but like a shared insight that happens when you can start to see the world from different people's points of view. 
Um, so everybody, everybody has what I would call a distance to reality. And you can, you can imagine what that looks like in this picture. If you think about the CEO who's collaborating with this group here um, with a developer and you've got um, someone who's a head of product having a conversation with an analyst somewhere else. Like they're, they're, how close they are to the coalface is going to be different. They're going to have a different view of what's happening and they're going to see things differently. Um, and although that can be uncomfortable sometimes in a workshop, it's really valuable for building that shared insight that you need in order to work out what to do next. So let's talk about that a little bit more. I want to show you that as an example. I want to talk, I want to talk about distance to reality. So what you probably see in, does anyone know what this photo is off the bat? Probably not, okay. So what we can see up close is a woman sitting outside in the afternoon sun. It's not a particularly interesting or meaningful image. Um, but when we take a, a step back and we see it from a slightly different angle, we can see that you know, now there's a group of people and perhaps they're friends. Maybe they're just a group of people sharing the sunshine. Uh, maybe they're having lunch. They're at a waterway. Somebody's been on a bike. It's probably still not really that interesting. But if we zoom out one step further, it's September 11. And the whole meaning of this picture has completely changed because of how far away, um, how far away the camera is. So we can invert that metaphor as well. Um, in this example, it implies that those that are closest don't see the full picture. But I think people in the room would, um, would agree that a, a lot of the time, the person with the 10,000 foot view doesn't see significant things that are happening much closer in. So it goes both ways. Uh, there's also this idea of different realities. So uh, does anyone recognize this picture now after, after we've zoomed out the full way? This is, um, I, hadn't, I hadn't before I was searching for an image to explain that metaphor, but I understand now that it's quite a famous photo from, from that event. Um, because it's quite famous, it's been, had a lot of people's interpretations what they understand this picture to be about, and some of the um, some of the more common ones, you know, some people see it as an allegory or a story of a country that believes in moving on. That, you know, hours later after an event has happened, these people seemingly having a good time and they've already put it past them and that's a commentary on American culture. Um, pretty harsh for sure. Um, another interpretation is for the people sitting in the photo who complained that they didn't give permission to have their photo taken, they talk about this photo being about profound shock and disbelief. And that actually they're, you know, they're discussing what had happened and it's, you know, you can't take a picture of a feeling, you can't see it. Um, and now 10 years, 10 years or more later, to most people this is a picture about the past, it's about history. Um, and that this, you know, this, this picture doesn't, this event doesn't, doesn't belong in the present, it's part of history now. Um, so just an example of how people see different, they see things differently. If we bring this back to software development, <laughs> um, you know, perhaps this is how we think that business people think. And I know a lot of people think that this is what designers do. Um, but the biggest, the, the biggest impact happens here um, when we can overlay those different points of view and perspectives on a problem to be solved and solve it together. That's the important part. So the question is, how might we begin to work better together for bigger impact? Um, I don't have a full answer for that. I think that it starts with understanding each other and, and valuing the different realities and figuring out ways to um, help each other understand better uh, so that we can have a bigger impact because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. And I think that that should include technology. So that, you know, the follow-up question is, how might we use what we see to inform strategy um, how many people in the room feel like they have a significant and ongoing influence on the strategy of the things that you build? That's awesome. That's really, that's great. That's really good. Um, so I'm not sure about all of the best ways to make this happen. Um, some of those people that raise their hands, I'd love to hear from you perhaps later on about ways that you've been able to do that and ways that um, you know, we could use that on other projects to be more inclusive. Um, on our project, through the magic of workshops, we did have some success in defining a vision and we've got things to do now. Um, we come back to this idea of what does vision do, what does strategy do, it should enable action. Um, and why do we take action? We take action to create an impact. So 
that's what we want it to be. Uh, that's what we want strategy to be. Now we've got to think a little bit about how that relates to execution when we're actually building things. And what do we see commonly in execution? I think um, you know we have this. I, th I think it starts to go wrong when we're focusing on the wrong things. So if we're focusing on features to build instead of problems to solve or opportunities to exploit or these things. Um, then we start to focus in the wrong areas. Um, and often that happens because the strategy mandates what you're going to build. So I think there's a power in stopping that from happening and being inclusive and having everybody involved in doing strategy. Um, it is a lot easier to measure delivery than it is to measure impact. Um, there's been a few comments to that effect already today. Um, I think sometimes we end up focusing on the wrong things because it starts here sometimes. I'm not knocking these things that we do. They're useful tools, but often it's the way that they're used that kind of causes us to set our focus on the things that aren't the most meaningful. So that kind of thing sometimes causes this. And I'm sure there's people in the room that have been bashed about this type of thing at every step. You know, you're four weeks late um, and you're not delivering those things that you said you were going to deliver and that's what you're accountable for. You're accountable for delivering the features, not for creating the impact that, you, that you're set, setting out to try and achieve. So how do we do that better? How can we do better execution? How can we bring that closer? That's a whole nother talk. I highly recommend checking out Ben Kapler's talk on continuous design and delivery. Um, he put that together uh, just last week. Um, mostly it's based on a fairly large project in Turkey with Hepsi Barada, which is essentially, for people that aren't familiar, it's Amazon in, in uh, sorry, it's eBay for Turkey. And there's a fairly large scale software project happening there where design, uh, what they're trying to achieve is continuous design in delivery. Um, what that's all about for me and why I think why I've called this out is that it's a way of owning impact together. Um, it's, it, it talks to the Agile Manifesto too. We were talking about wanting to be truly agile as opposed, and having adaptive planning as opposed to trying to have predictive plans and locked in schedules. Um, so I think the focus here is about individuals and interactions over and above the other things that sometimes get in the way. Um, and this is not a design trick. Continuous design isn't a design trick. It's a way of working. Um, and it's a way of bringing people together across disciplines, and I think there's some real power in that for execution. So check that out. It's a, it's a great talk. What I'm going to show you, though, is a, um, a time-lapse video from that project that um, really shows it in action. So this is about 40 seconds long. I'm just going to play it and do my best and narrate as Ben would when he's talking through what was going on here. So what you can see is design and delivery happening at the same time. There's a lot of movement, a lot of action happening. Um, in the top right, on the top right corner, you can see the Kanban wall. Um, people are gathered around that at various points. On um, the bottom left is the backlog, and uh, the product owner, BA, and iteration manager are moving between that and the Kanban wall. You see them going back and forward. Um, at the bottom, in the middle, we can see that developers from other projects are coming to support, and their IT directors are coming to contribute. And generally, the environment just isn't static. There's a lot of things going on, apart from lunchtime. Um, you might notice that the design wall didn't really change much, um, but that's because the design's happening in conversations and collaboration. It's not happening necessarily at the wall. It's happening with these people working together to solve the problems that they've been um, tasked to solve in the way that makes the, most, that makes the most sense for the people doing the work. And that's something that I wish that we could, we could do more. Um, it's not to say that it's easy. If you spoke with Ben or if you look at his talk, you know, you'll see him um, articulate just how messy and difficult that can be, even for really experienced teams. It's uncomfortable. It's a different way of working, um, and it, can really, it really can be difficult, but it's worthwhile. So their focus is on owning the impact together, um, and one way that they do that is by bringing continuous learning and validation right to the core. Um, Here's some examples from that project of the impact that they were able to deliver because of this approach. And you can probably recognize from the card that the, what they're using is hypothesis-driven development. Um, to learn, you need a hypothesis. Um, and hypothesis, it's just an experiment. It's a fancy word for an experiment. So um, the Hepsi Barada team working together to, um, to learn by doing. Um, you know, pick something small and learn from doing it and adapt your strategy as you learn from that experience. It's about outcomes, not outputs. Uh, Barry O'Reilly has this to say about um, hypothesis-driven development, um, and it really talks to, again, just that basic scientific method. Um, I've, I'm sure there's lots of people in the room that are familiar with Barry. Um, he's written a terrific article on, on this topic, which I'd recommend checking out. That's where you can get it. 
Um, and he sort of talks through the, uh, somebody, somebody mentioned earlier how hard it is to define and measure impact. Um, I can say that's definitely true. Um, talking about, uh, you know, est estimating a story and breaking it down into pieces and then delivering, it, uh, delivering on it and reporting your status back um, isn't always easy, but I feel like it's easier than defining what effect you want to have on your customers and then figuring out how to measure that and prove it. Um, Here's some examples of how we're trying to do that on the project that, that I'm heading up at the moment. Um, we've broken it down into parts um, to try and understand uh, the result that we want to try and achieve and how, we, how we're going to test it. And we're taking prototype means design prototype, it's low fidelity, and our testing approach needs to be different to how we will measure this when, um, when we try it in the market, either with a mass audience or with a smaller group of people to try and validate our ideas. Um, here's another example. Um, so for me, these are um, yeah, reasonably well crafted. I think that they resonate with people, the people that understand them. Um, they're six lines, but there's a lot more work that went into um, arriving at those, at those six lines that articulate what we're trying to achieve with that particular experiment, with that particular hypothesis. They're also fairly high level. Um, they're not. They're fairly broad. There's a lot of different ways that um, we might try and execute on that impact. Um, and I think that's important. That's, that's an important feature of this type of approach because nobody's telling anybody what the feature should be or what it should look like or what platforms it should be done on or um, how many screens it needs to have or what, for, what uh, form fields need to be part of those screens. None of that's there. All we care about is delivering on the, the impact that we're trying to achieve. Um, and I think that that empowers teams. Um, I don't think that it's necessarily the most comfortable thing, but I think what that does is allows freedom to act. It allows teams to work it out amongst themselves instead of being told what to do. So back to the double diamond. Um, we're, we're looking at, we've talked about defining strategy, uh, understanding why we, uh, why we need to take action and define how we're going to take it. Um, now we can talk a little bit about what it means to, to bring execution closer to that, starting to create the outcome. Um, I think this part's probably more familiar for most of us. It's certainly more familiar, more familiar than for me. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about using prototypes and that being at the heart of the user-centered design approach. Um, but it's possible for us to do this in software experiments too, to validate solutions. Um, and that, if, if we do that in, with, a live, with live customers in a live market, that gives us a whole different level of feedback. What you can learn from testing a low fidelity prototype in front of customers, even if it's task based and you're trying to see how they would respond to, a, to an interface, it's different to measuring what people actually do out in the wild. Um, and that's a, that's a really valuable thing to do. So perhaps if you're doing software experiments at this stage, some of them might go on to be the actual product. Some of them might serve the purpose of just validating so that you can then build that feature or that set of features in a robust way ready for, uh, ready for production. So what this allows us to do in the, in the explore part is that we, our knowledge becomes deeper. We learn more from doing. Um, and once we have validated, um, once we have explored some options and started to validate what the right thing to do is, then the focus becomes about building it right and making it robust and making it robust enough for the real world. And we start shifting toward measuring actual impact that's actually happening in market. So I would argue that this part of the um, process is becoming less interesting for software developers. Um, you know, I think that well-crafted solutions are beautiful, absolutely, and I think that applies to more than just software development. Um, but I think we'd all agree that the right solution well-crafted is better. Um, and I think it's trying to move the skills and ways of thinking uh, and approaches and, and, the, and the different view that we have on things further to the left of this diagram is I think where the biggest impact can happen. So one criticism of this whole way of thinking, this whole approach is that it feels a bit linear. Um, but I, my <coughs> argument is that if we truly are agile across strategy and execution, and what I mean by that is that we're, we have an adaptive vision and we're doing um, you know, we're responding to new insight and we're setting a direction that's just enough to be able to respond to it, then it's not linear at all. It's more like this. And, you know, we want to try and understand what tools we can use or approaches we can use from software development right up front all the way up in understanding. Um, software experiments is one 
obvious candidate that we can do that early on. But what other things are there? Most of the tools at this point of um, customer research and business model type things. How can we bring technology further, um, closer to the trigger that starts the thinking to begin with? So I can't think of a reason why it needs to be idea, strategy, plan, prototype, build. Why can't it be minimum vision, software experiment, learn and understand, product revision, and then refine and execute? It's probably not the normal. I'd have to say I've not been involved in too many projects that have taken that path. Um, but there's no reason that it can't be that way. And this is really what it's about. When we bring it all together, when we try and bring execution closer to um, defining strategy, it's about thinking big and starting small and acting quickly and then changing your plan as you learn more. The parting thoughts that I've got that I think um, that, that, we should, that we should own is knowing what the impact is. I think um, strategy and execution have established that they are worthless without each other. And so to me, that implies that we're all responsible for impact. It's not the business people's thing. It's not the customer research people. It's not technologists alone. It's all of us. Everybody's responsible for delivering impact. And so you should own the impact. If you don't understand the impact that you're trying to deliver on the software project that you're working on, um, you should be able to ask, or you should be able to find out, or you should be able to influence what it is if nobody else knows. So I think knowing the impact and owning the impact are really important. Um, acknowledging that strategy is worthless without execution and that execution benefits from good strategy and then finding ways that we can work better, work better together for bigger impact. Thanks very much.